Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Uh, thank you for Blue Water Cruising Association for hosting this event. So what we're going to talk about today, because the main purpose of today is we've got some background knowledge about what things do. And most of you are not going to be necessarily redesigning your electrical system based on my information. You're maybe going to be adding one. You're maybe clarifying some things in your mind. But what it comes down to, a lot of us, we should all be better troubleshooters. I mean, that's a good goal, right? It's not that you aren't or you are. It's a journey. And over time, you want to be better at troubleshooting. And that's what we're going to be talking about today. That's really the goal of today, is how do we all collectively become better troubleshooters? Because unfortunately, we can't just, even if you have endless money, Unfortunately, sometimes people aren't beside you and you're in a place where you can't get support and you can't even get on the phone because you're in a place where there's no cell coverage and you've got to figure it out on your own. And that's also the allure of boating and also the fear of boating. You know, it's sort of doing your own journey on the water and sometimes you have to accept the fact that something might not work and it's going to be on you and you alone to try to resolve that problem. So there's no such thing as being completed with troubleshooting or perfect. Uh, even uh, people in our organization are, it's a constant journey. You know, every year we're getting better at it, more and more feedback. And I invite you today to not consider yourself a pro. Look at yourself as I can always grow, okay? So that's sort of how we're going to take this course today. So the first step of this journey that we're going to go together is talking about the fundamentals of electrical. Okay, because that's going to be very important when we start troubleshooting electrical problems. So here we have, what's voltage? I mean, we've all heard that word, right? Uh, it's pretty common. Batteries have voltage. AC has voltage. In our homes, uh, we have 120, you know, 220. Uh, in our boats, pretty much all of us have either 120 AC or 12 volts DC. Some of us in... Uh, Boats will have even 24 volts DC. I've got older boats that had 32 volts DC. And basically what that means is the higher the voltage, the higher the potential for an energy, right? It's, think about the water analogy is a really good one. Think about it. yesterday I was trying to bring that up, the analogy of a dam, right? Nobody's damming a lake for one foot of delta. I mean, that's not, not going to create a lot of power. But these huge mega dam projects that we have here in Canada are a huge amount of water, and the water, it's the delta. How much from the top of one end of the reservoir to the bottom at the other end? And that's really, that height, that column of water height, translates to power, right? That's what makes the turbines turn faster. And so, what we're doing here with voltage is very similar. So 12 volts, pretty reasonable. We have voltage, you know, in our cars. It's, all cars are pretty much 12 volts. And so that's when you touch a battery post, both positive and negative, you're not really going to get electrocuted because there's not a lot of voltage potential between a positive and negative post. And your body is a good amount of resistance, so there's not endless current that can go through it and you're not going to get zapped. But yesterday we talked about my unwillingness or uneasiness to put a solar panel array and put 100 volts of DC on a pleasure boater's boat, right? Because most of us assume DC to be benign and we're sort of cautious around AC at 120. So here we've got a little analogy of a little turbine turning, and if you had you know, 1.5 volts, again, that would be a small little tur smaller turbine, okay? So voltage is like water pressure, I brought that up. We're all trying to find different analogies. They're not perfect, but it's, it's about conveying a concept so that we understand that voltage has a very big significant impact and if things are going to run on your boat or not. You can't expect your, for example, fridge or a water pump to work at 8 volts because it's not enough voltage differential to actually have current go through the circuit and make it work. Right? That's when you talk about voltage. If the voltage is too low, things, a lot of things are not going to start working. Some electronics are going to stop working. You need enough of a voltage differential for it to work. So, and one last point, and I remember when I was a kid, I didn't understand this. <clears throat> I, was, I was curious, and it was pretty hard on my parents, because I asked a lot of annoying questions. I was like, why does mom's car have a voltmeter that doesn't go from 0 to 12, but goes from 12 
to maybe, or 10 to 16. And why is the middle 14? And I was like, that doesn't make sense. It's a 12 volt battery. Shouldn't 12 volt be like a fuel tank from zero to X and the middle be six volts? And that's when you start realizing that voltage, there's no such thing as a six volt, 12 volt battery bank that is half empty. Your range with voltage, a full battery is 12.6, 12.8, and a half empty battery bank is 12.2. So 0.6 volts, that's a tiny delta, right? What's the difference between 12.2 to 12.6? I mean, that's 0.4 volts. That 0.4 volts is the difference of 50% of your battery capacity. That's significant. And so that's why all the time you hear about technicians, engineers, boaters, they're like, volts matter. Resistance is a problem. You can't have a bad connection on your boat because a bad connection causes resistance. Resistance causes voltage drop. And if you're saying that 0.4 volts is 50% of capacity, that's a lot that you can lose on a bad circuit on your boat. And that's why voltage matters, okay? So the other concept is resistance. You absolutely have to have resistance on a circuit. And it took me a long time to figure that out. I didn't even understand that in university. Didn't get it. <laughs> didn't get it. I didn't understand. I knew what a dead short was, but I really didn't understand the importance of a load between the positive and negative wire and how that load effectively is a resistance that slows the current from going through a wire. So if you connect, for example, with a wrench, done that, been there, a positive and negative post together, Besides burning your hand and having the battery post melt and having sparks everywhere and literally running for your life, you'll see that there's a crazy amount of amperage that goes through a positive to a negative post because that's called a dead short. And a wrench has pretty much no resistance. It's a piece of metal, right? And metal as a wire is pretty very conductive, right? Not all metals are equal and on boats we use uh, copper as a conductive Right? In all the wires, there might be tin, they don't look copper, but they're tin copper or they're welding cable and non-marine and they're just copper wire. So resistance is essential. You don't want too much resistance, but you want a resistance because if you don't have a resistance, then you have a dead short, positive to negative. So you have to have a load and that's what a resistance is. A water pump is some sort of resistance. A light is some sort of resistance. All these devices are actually resistances. Everything on your boat that turns on is going to slow down the current between the positive and the negative post. But you don't want more resistance than the loads requires because then you're wasting power. Then it's causing a voltage drop. And when we wire a boat, we wire the boat for the appliance, not saying, well, I'm assuming that the connections are going to be crappy over time. I'm assuming that the wire is going to be, you know, maybe compacted. It's going to be in a huge bundle. They're wiring your boat and they're thinking that someone's going to maintain that electrical system to be within reason. It doesn't need to be perfect, but it needs to be good, right? The connections have to be good. And so with water analogy, again, think about resistance. So here's a pipe. That would be a dead short, right? Perfect. It's a piece of wire. It's a perfect piece of wire. There's no corrosion on it. It's brand new. Everything about it is great. But if you actually constrict that wire, i.e. bring a connector and don't crimp it properly, which is pretty common, most, a lot of boat fires happen because of that. Or you have a connector and you don't screw it on really hard. Been there, done that. I remember when I had my boat in 07, 06, I didn't properly torque a inverter connection on my own boat and the fuse block melted. Scared the living crap out of me. And that's a good thing to remember in life. You, you got to learn, right? Don't blame anyone else other than yourself. And I tell that a lot to my technicians when they come on board. I said, don't give me a million excuses why something doesn't work and it's not to do with you. I said, look at yourself and always blame yourself first. Because realistically, equipment's going to work and generally it's the installer that's the problem. And that's a good philosophy to do all of us. And so if you've got a, you installed, for example, a downrigger circuit. You installed um, a new fridge, a, I don't know, it could be anything, a, a fan, a piece of navigation equipment that draws a, a certain amount of power and it's not working. Your first instinct shouldn't be, I'm going to return the fridge back to the vendor who sold it to me. <coughs> first reaction should be, huh, 
what did I do that wasn't out of the box? And then you're like, I did a connection. Was that connection really good? Maybe it's not. You know what? Let's redo it. You redo the connection, and then like, oh, perfect, it works. Look inward. You're going to save a lot more time. Remember that example of the client yesterday that returned three Nespresso machines because they were always, and he was upset? Well, that's something that we could all do, right? You're just thinking that it's outside. But then at one point, after the third time, he's like, oh, maybe it's not me, but it's my boat that's the problem. So resistance is a big issue and it constricts flow, right? It causes a voltage drop, okay? When we put a load on a circuit, like a light bulb, uh, like a water pump, a windlass, it could be a starter is also a load. All those devices need power, but they're also going to limit the current going through it, right? Because otherwise you're in a dead short. You're effectively having, for that very portion of where the load is, you're slowing down the current, okay? And this analogy shows sort of like a filament of a light bulb, you know. Um, you're thinking about those really nice old school Edison light bulbs and you have that beautiful filament that's bright, you know. It's of course sort of traditional. You see that on patios in the summer now or uh, in outdoor spaces. Well, that's what it is. I mean, that filament is slowing down the current, right. And at the same time, it's overheating because it's, that's the purpose. You're trying to create light. And a toaster is the same thing. You know, toaster has tons of filaments in there and you're creating heat by having a resistance. Okay, so I'm not trying to scare anyone here, um, but there's a formula. It's okay, it's not a bad one. Okay. Current is equal to voltage over R, which is resistance, or going back to school, you can start moving that, right? You could move this over here voltage is equal to current times resistance or depends how you want to slice and dice it doesn't matter but this is how we're looking at it right so if you want to calculate how much current is going to go through an appliance you figure out what's your starting voltage divided by the resistance which is known the unit of measures on ohms and then you're going to get your current now most of you are not going to be doing this you know every day on the boat. This is giving you the fundamentals. This is, we're going to come back, but you're not going to be calculating things because generally what's going to happen is when you're going to buy a water pump, they're going to tell you what the fuse is and they're going to say, this water pump draws eight amps, you're going to put in eight amp fuse. That's how you know what current you need to put in, right? And that, then you size your wire accordingly. The manufacturer is doing a lot of the math for you or they're going to give you the wattage, which we're going to talk about next. So I just want to elaborate here, but if you've got a current of 6 amps and a resistance of 2 ohms, all of this is going to make sense because 12 over 2 equals 6 amps, right? And it's a way to limit a dead short, right? Without that light bulb there, the wire would have to be incredibly huge to not overheat, right? It would have to be way bigger than a thumb. It would have to be able to handle thousands of amps, right? And so that's why you don't want a dead short, and so you always have a load. Always, always have a load. All right, the next thing we're going to talk about is, and this is, this is relevant. This is extremely relevant. Ignore at your peril. One day you're going to change the batteries on your boat, or someone will, and it's going to come time to rewire your battery bank. And you might have a little bit of bravado on the way out and you're like, this is so easy. I got this. Babes, I know what I'm doing and you're undoing those wires faster than you can undo any connections. You forgot to do a diagram, forgot to take a picture and you didn't label. Because that's later's problem. But right now, you're in getting stuff done problem. And you got it done. And I cannot tell you how many calls I get in the summer from other boaters that forgot that first step, draw it down. Make notes, label everything, because later on, you're gonna be figuring out how do you wire all these golf cart batteries in series and in parallel. And I sometimes have owners that, you know, have wired a battery bank and it's 18 volts. It's possible, it's, you know, we, I don't even laugh about it. And honestly, you know, it's, it's not like we're all electricians and we're all doing my job for a living. And so the point is, it's very important to be able to measure voltage in different places at different points of your circuit so that you, when you're rewiring your battery bank 
And I always tell, like, are we measuring 12 volts at the battery bank? Or is it 18? Is it 24? How did you wire that battery bank back up? Okay. And here, notice the probes, the colors changed. Polarity is really also important with batteries, right? If you, for example, hook up a fan in the wrong polarity, it's going to turn backwards, right? You, you can never, ever, ever, black and white, connect your boat's batteries positive to your negative terminal and vice versa. That can never happen. Like, that is a golden rule. It's like you cannot go on incoming traffic and run towards a car coming at you. Like, it's not going to happen well. Like, you will have, it's going to be fireworks, okay? Polarity is absolutely essential on your boat. Hence, and we're going to talk about that later at the second part of this presentation, we're going to be talking about how color coding is a really good indication of polarity, right? And we'll talk about that. Now look at this. This is actually sort of a good indication. Here we've got, you know, 1.5 volt batteries. There's probably AA batteries. But, you know, you could do this with golf cart batteries. Replace the 1.5 and make this a six volt golf cart, and this is a six volt golf cart, and instead of having three volts here in series, right, for the total combined voltage, you have now 12 volts. That's pretty popular. Golf cart batteries are not an uncommon device. You know, probably at least half of us have golf cart batteries on our boats, or L16s, which are just big golf carts, but we'll have batteries that are not all 12 volts. And anybody who has a 24 volt battery bank doesn't have a 24 volt battery. They have a battery that's 24 volts by combining other batteries in series to get to 24 volts. Or some of you might have 32 volt batteries and you'll buy four 8 volt batteries and wire them in series to make a 32 volt battery. Now look at here this example. This one is a little bit different. Notice the positive connected to the positive, negative to negative. So this is now a parallel connection. And that would be really common on a lot of our boats. Again, we're not buying a battery on a boat. You're generally buying a battery bank. And you might have two batteries, you might have 10 batteries, you might have four batteries. And if they're all 12 volts, you're going to be measuring all of those or connecting all those batteries in parallel, positive to positive to positive to positive, and negative to negative and negative. And then that way the voltage stays the same and the amp hours keep adding. Okay? So this is an example. And I, we brought that up yesterday. Um, if you've got a 100 amp hour battery bank here and a 100 amp hour battery bank here, show of hands who thinks that this will be a 24 volt 100 amp hour battery bank. Anybody show of hands? Okay. Show of hands who thinks this is going to be a 12 volt 200 amp hour battery bank. Oh God, I'm so happy. <laughs> That's perfect. Yeah. Two 12 volt batteries in parallel, the volts stay the same and the amp hours add up, right? So you get a 200 amp hour 12 volt battery. I was emphasizing this a lot. Short circuits are not jokes, right? An example of a short circuit that could happen on your boat, could literally happen on your boat, is your alternator positive post, or the positive post on your alternator has a cable to it, that cable is most likely unfused. And if it ever falls off your alternator, which is very possible because alternator posts do break because of the vibration, and it lands on your engine block, right, and your engine block is negative, you have a negative cable unfused going to the engine block, and you have a positive cable unfused going to your alternator, it's very possible, you're going to have a dead short. Dead shorts are end of days. We're going to do a little video later on and I'm going to show you what happens when you have a dead short and it's, it's, it's not a uh, campfire where you're uh, cooking a hot dog. There's not a slight amount of smoke. There's so much smoke, it's like being blind. You can't see, you couldn't, put a, you couldn't see a finger in front of your nose at four centimeters, five inches from your nose. You're going to be completely, utterly blind. It's not fog. It's beyond that. You're completely blind. And so dead short, what happens is not only does the current go so fast and so quick down that wire, is it melts the jacket. The insulation of the wire melts. And when that jacket melts, it's 
literally creates a, a smoke bomb that is epic. It's like a Navy SEAL smoke bomb blew up in your boat. And I'm not even seeing like in the movies. It is absolutely epic. You can never, ever, ever have a dead short on your boat. And that's why manufacturers are really big on putting, for example, positive boots, you know, a protective boot on your starter circuit. How many of you think you still have a positive boost boot on your starter circuit at the starter solenoid that is still connected on that? Probably less than 10, 15% of you. And the reason why is because some mechanic or some technician or yourself saw it there, it was annoying because you wanted to measure voltage or do a connection. You pulled it back and you left it pulled back. And if that wire ever breaks off a starter solenoid post and lands on the engine, which is completely all negative, right? You're inches away from a dead short. And if that wire lands on your engine block, it's game over. Game over, your boat, it's done. Like, look for the exits. You're going over, there's no rescuing a dead short on a two watt wire. The bundles of wires are all gonna short. It's catastrophic failure. So that's why all the manufacturers and the builders put positive boots on all those terminals, on, especially on a starter solenoid. But over time, people forgot the reason why, and it's just a nuisance, it's an annoyance. And so they just pull them back, they peel them over, and then the positive post on the starter solenoid is exposed. So I'm gonna talk here a little bit about what is a watt. Watt is a really good unit of measure. Now that is completely relatable, and if it isn't today and you don't know what a watt is, I, I, wanna, I want you to think about a watt, we talk about watts all the time. You buy a microwave, it's gonna tell you how much watch, watts it is. You're buying a hair dryer, it's how many watts it is. You're buying a windlass, how many watts? An 800 watt windlass, a 1500 watt windlass. Watts are really the unit of measure, and then it's a combination of here are some few examples, like a light bulb, 60 watts. LEDs are obviously a lot less than that. You remember we had in our homes as kids, 100 watt light bulbs, not uncommon, right? They were obviously not LED. A radio transmitting, 25 watts. A windlass, 1200 watts. Microwave could be 1200. You know, we're sizing inverters, 2000 watt, 3000 watt. I had a conversation this morning, a 5000 watt inverter, right? Watts is a really good unit of measure because it tells you the unit of measure of electrical power, okay, that is required to run that appliance. And that is a combination of two things. Power is equal voltage times amps. P equals VI, okay? And generally, you won't know the resistance of an appliance, but you'll know the wattage. So for example, if you have a 1200 watt microwave and you're running it at 120, right? 120 volts, that's gonna draw 10 amps. 120 times 10 equals 1200. But if you were gonna try to run that microwave from 12 volts and you're at 12, 12 volts to make 1200 watts, you need 100 amps. So you see how that's why the wire size gets much bigger on a boat because it's a factor of 10. To run the same appliance at 120 versus 12, at 12 you're gonna need basically 10 times more amps, assuming everything is efficient, to run the same appliance at a lower voltage. Amps is really, and I tried to emphasize this yesterday, I'm gonna reiterate, is really the rate at which the flow of electrons are happening at any given moment. It's not a unit, of, it's not a quantity. Here's the, uh, the correlation between voltage times current equals power, or you can change it around and have power divided by voltage equals current. And this is where the microwave analogy, right? 1200 watt microwave over 120 volt circuit is 10 amps, right? That's what you would expect. And what you're gonna put a breaker, and we're gonna talk about breakers in a little bit, Typical breakers for 15 amps, so you never have nuisance tripping, right? You don't size the breaker exactly what you need. You give yourself a little bit of room. And then you also wire the wire gauge to be able to handle 15 amps. 
so that you don't have nuisance tripping. So the wire can handle 15, the breaker is 15, and the load is 10, so that you never get nuisance tripping. If that breaker trips, you know that you went way over what the rated amperage you would have expect from a 1200 watt microwave. Question is, when you're sizing, I'll bring that later because we're going to talk about fuses and breakers. There are ratios of how do you size a breaker or a fuse. And generally, you're right, the other way of looking at it is a ratio of 25% bigger than what you need. So 25% over 80 is 100, which is the exact same math. So it's either 80% of your load is maximum or you do 1.25 of what your load is going to be to give you your breaker size or your fuse size, okay? Here's the example of a windlass. You've got a windlass and it's a 1200 watt windlass, right? And you're running it on 12 volts. That windlass will draw 100 amps. Now, think about what would happen if, and this is a good one, if your voltage is higher because you're running your alternator on your boat, right? Your alternator is running, it's recharging that battery bank, you have a higher voltage, the amperage goes higher. The opposite is also true. If your battery bank is really low and you're running, for example, now your battery bank is at 10.5 volts, the amperage going through the windlass is much higher. Right? So that's why it's always a good idea to have, for example, your thruster or your windlass only operating when your engine is running and making sure that your alternator is connected to that battery bank that's running those items because then you're reducing the overall amperage on that device because the voltage is higher. And look at the other example which is also very important and also why so many builders are tending to try to go to 24 volts is if you've got a 1200 watt windlass on 24 volts, suddenly you only have a 50 amp load. You double the voltage, you reduce the amperage by half. That's good, right? That's what you want. So when you get to about a 60 footer, you'll see those boats are going to be pretty much wired everything at 24, and then what they end up doing is doing DC to DC converters to run some loads that can only be run at 12. But they'll basically, the starters are 24, everything is 24 volts, and then there might, some electronics don't want to be at, at 24, so they'll install a converter that goes from 24 to 12. So you don't have a 12 volt battery bank and a 24 volt battery bank. All your battery banks on your boat are 24, and the loads that need 12 volts, you run them through DC to DC converters. That's why half the load is on 220. That's exactly right. The point was, why is Europe in 220 and North America 120? Europe was a retrofit build. North America was green. Cities were still not double. Everything was being built. So the length between the distance of the substation to all the new homes, everything was going to be new. So they were able to keep the voltages down because they knew that they had a better control environment. But in Europe, Europe was there before electricity. They had to retrofit. And so they knew that it'd be a hell of a run to get to somewhere. And so then they went to 220 and that's why we're 120 in North America. But it also means that you have half the conductor size in Europe. And that's what makes bringing a boat from Europe a huge challenge. <laughs> I can tell you because I go through that process all the time. Now it's great for revenue generating, but as, a boat, as an owner, if you did not anticipate that and you thought that you could simply just magically happen and you didn't ask questions prior, welcome to a world of hurt. A world of hurt. It's, all the wiring is half the size it needs to be to be 120. You can't just change the outlet because they can get away with half the wire size because they're running a 220. Mind you, and then you've got to worry about Hertz and all the appliances have to be changed that are running at 50 because we run at 60, right? But the wire size is really important. And there's a big push nowadays with builders, they're going through that push to go into 24 because a lot of the electronics now are running from 10 volts, some are eight to 32. They're like, give me anything from eight to 32 volts, I'm gonna run fine. That's a huge range. And the more the manufacturers are doing that, the less and less we need to run anything at 12 volts, which is going to make one day sort of like uh, with, uh, you know, VHS versus Beta. Beta was better, but it didn't win. 12, nobody should have 12 volts on their boat, but that's where cars came from, and then basically modifying, and it was sort of like, 
we just got down a rat hole and we couldn't get ourselves out. But it makes no sense that a 50-foot boat that has endless electronics and electrical systems on board are running at 12 volts when a car is absolutely indis... There's no point of comparison between the loads in a car and the loads on a 50-foot boat. So at one point, the builders ha have to abandon 12, and then they go to 24. Question, are DC to DC converters the same size as inverters? No, there's DC to DC converters that are this small, depending on the amperage. A 30 amp DC to DC converter might be this big, this big, and about this narrow. It depends on the amperage. We install them all the time on bridges on a lot of power boats. They get a lot of voltage drop because it's a 12 volt boat, and we'll do a DC to DC 12 to 12, but we'll output 13.5, and even if it's 10, that way every time they run the thrust or the electronics don't, you know, be dis aren't disconnected from a power source. So there's a lot of tools. Remember we talked about that yesterday. You know, people come with a hammer and they're like, I'm ready to build a high rise. And you're like, well, I think you're going to need a little bit more than just a hammer in your toolkit, right? And so electricians or engineers that like to learn, they sort of look at, oh my God, look at all the possibilities that I can do stuff with. And the designers of electrical systems use DC to DC converters all the time as a way to keep either a voltage steady or to convert a voltage from, and it could be also 12 to 24, right? It could be both, it could be the other way, it could be 24 to 12, or 12 to 24, or 32 to 12, right? Some boats, like a Bertram, for example, they're all 32 volts, right? How do you run, you know, you got a 32 volt bolt, how do you run loads? So you take a 32 volt to 12 volt converter. And then that way it avoids you having a 12 volt battery bank on board on top of your 32 volt battery banks. The inverters can, the, the question, can, can DC to DC converters be stacked? No. You would basically, there's a limitation of the amount of amperage that can go through, and then you would put multiple of them and do subgroups. They might be stacked, but I don't know of any that are sort of in the pleasure boat business. My, when I say no, I, to my knowledge, no. But who knows, I mean, the world is so bigger than what I know. Okay, so we've got di direct current, right? That's what we have on our boats for the majority, right? Like our lights, most of our lights on boats, unless you have a really huge mega yacht, then yeah, everything is AC. But for the most part, everything on our boats are run, anything that doesn't plug into an AC outlet is gonna be running off direct current, like our cars, right? It's running off of battery. There's no inverter, and it's basically a voltage potential between a positive and a negative, right? <coughs> and electrons flow in one direction, and that's why it's called direct current, as opposed to alternating current, which is everywhere here in the room, right? But phones are DC, and that's why we have USB chargers, right? They're five volts DC. Laptops, they're DC, because it's a battery, but we're converting through a cable AC to DC, right? That's what that is. And those ones flow in both directions, okay? You're gonna have AC coming from shore power or your generator. But remember, does AC come out of an alternator? Yes or no? No. no? no. No, it doesn't. And honestly, you'd be surprised. A lot of people think that. And it's not, there's no such thing as a silly question. It's all confusing. But yeah, your alternator has nothing to do with alternating current on your boat. None at all. Alternating current can come from an inverter, right? Because remember, we talked about an inverter. Inverters convert, well, it doesn't convert. It takes DC power inverts it to make AC. You could have a generator, or you could have shore power to create AC on your boat. And most of us on most boats are gonna have either 120 or 220. Bigger boats, 220, but most of us have uh, 120. So question, if you're bringing a boat uh, from a 220 boat, and you want to run it at 120 in North America, for example, what are the implications? The implications are not for 12 volts. Your DC stuff is fine. You're starting your engine is fine. Uh, any, your refrigerator that's running off DC is fine. Your nav lights are fine. I mean, 12 volts in Europe, 12 volts here, it's 12 to 12, no problem, right? It's identical, no problem there. So direct current, no problem at all. Anything running out of your batteries, no problem. The challenge is if your boat has any sort of AC appliances, like a 
an inverter, a hot water tank, AC outlets, um, could be a battery charger. All those devices, your shore power plug, galvanic isolator, an isolation transformer, all of those devices were spec for 220 in Europe. And if they're in 220 in Europe, they're not wiring a boat 220 in Europe and they're paying double the wire, not double, not double, but they're not buying double the size of wire they need in Europe so that one day someone can bring their boat to North America and have it just easily retrofitted to 120. If you're buying a boat that's 220, people in Europe build it to spec for 220 boat. And all the wiring is size for 220. And if you change the outlet from a 220 outlet to a 120, the wire size is going to be one size too small in North America versus what it was in Europe. So that means that wire is, one size too small is like having no wire at all, right? I had, for example, give you an example, previous owner. On my boat, this, this is, I've got burn marks all over my body. You don't see them, but I am scarred through my own pain and yours. Previous owner decides Catalina 36, 1990. There's not a lot of appliances on that boat. Builds the boat with a 15 amp outlet. Makes sense, 1990. Totally makes sense. It's easy, doesn't have to worry about plugging in in 30 amp receptacles. Previous owner decides, and I don't blame him, it's just hard, by the way, it's just hard. I'm gonna change, I want a 30 amp boat. There's a lot of things on my boat and I wanna run 30 amps. He changed the outlet to 30 amps, changed the breaker to 30 amps, left the wire 15 amp. Didn't change the wire. Cook the wire. That's exactly right. That's disconcerting, right? And that's why I have a profession of doing what I do. I mean, that's honestly my pain was my genesis for being here today and going, this is crazy. Like, I gotta solve this. Like, it's crazy. There has got to be a method to solve this madness. And that's what it is. And the same thing when you take a boat that 220, you can't just change the receptacles. And then you, let's say you do. And you change the receptacles, you change the wiring, but then all your appliances, except a battery charger, are basically built to run at 50 hertz, not 60. So now your hot water tank has to get out. If you've got a garbage compactor, it's got to come out. If you have, whatever AC appliances you have on your boat, they all got to go because they're not meant to run at 60 hertz. So if you have a generator, not a generator, but a air conditioning, it's got to get out. It's not meant to run at 60 hertz. So that's why it's painful. I wrote an article about it in Pacific Yachting, different ways of doing it. You don't have to do it all, but then you can, two systems, and it gets complicated. People are trying to save money, but it's just not simple. 